According to the ancient Egyptians, the world was filled with demons. For them, these beings were real, almost tangible. They tormented, aroused fear, caused disease, penetrated bodies and minds. Omnipresent, they accompanied people in every village and city. They appeared in the desert and in houses, but above all, they inhabited the entire Duat, the land of the dead. Though deadly and terrifying, their role in the underworld was to preserve Maat, the sacred order, balance and justice. For this purpose, hundreds of groups as well as individuals served there, each with a different function, appearance and behavior. There were two main categories of Egyptian demons. Those who inhabited the underworld and never left it, watching over their posts in the kingdom of Osiris, hence their name, the Guardians. The second group consisted of the so-called Wanderers, demons who wandered between dimensions, interacted with humans on the orders of the gods. We know them from numerous ritual, magical and medical texts, as they were supposed to cause illness and misfortune. They were responsible for possession and nightmares. Their actions were always a part of a divine plan, a punishment for wrongdoing. Hello everyone, my name is Irena. Welcome to my channel Ancient Sides Girl. I invite you to a podcast about the history of ancient Egypt. Today I'll take you on a journey through the Egyptian underworld. We will meet the mysterious and bizarre creatures inhabiting the Duat and look into the hell of the Egyptians, a place of annihilation described in all horrifying details as a real place in the complex geography of the Duat, the Kingdom of Osiris. But I have to warn you that the descriptions presented today will be macabre and literal and maybe disturbing, but all of them come from particularly interesting, original sources. Due to the lack of specification by the ancient Egyptians of a term corresponding to demon, Egyptological literature assigned this name to minor divinities, but often inconsistently, hence many misunderstandings. The protective spirits of the Egyptians, their guardian angels, are not generally referred to in Egyptology as demons, only the ones which are evil, menacing spirits, beings of chaos. Demons operated on the border between the world of gods and people, between order and chaos. They played an important role in maintaining Maat. As tools of Osiris, they guarded the underworld, obediently performing tasks, acting in their specific area, for example, guarding the gates of the Duat, most often in larger groups, creating a powerful and punishing army in the service of the great Egyptian gods. From the many scattered in the sacred books descriptions of individual demonic beings, some features are repeated, such as blindness, because they usually lived in darkness. Sometimes they were also deaf, and instead of speaking, they communicated by hissing or howling. Feeding on waste and impurities, they smelled terribly, both male and female, although there were very few of the latter. Above all, however, their appearance was the most terrifying. In the Book of the Dead, the Guardians, sometimes referred to as genies who guarded the gates of the Duat, were divided into triads. They acted as the doorkeepers, the watchers and the heralds. 
very rarely there was only one demon guarding the gate. Most often there were many of them, and one group of them corresponded to one of the three functions mentioned before. The Book of the Dead is one of the most famous religious compositions of ancient Egypt. Today we use its modern name. The ancients called it A Pertem Heru, Book of Coming Forth by Day. This funerary text was always addressed to a specific deceased whose name and titles were entered within the text. It's a kind of underworld playbook. The deceased after death could not immediately enjoy eternal life in the Egyptian paradise, Sekhet Aru, the field of reeds. First, he had to make a long and dangerous journey through the Duat, the underworld, and it was during this journey that the Book of the Dead was to protect him. It contained instructions, tips and advice to avoid all dangers, as well as special phrases and magical formulas to ensure the safety of the soul of the deceased, specifically his Ka, one of the nine aspects of the soul, represented as dead in its mortal form, as opposed to Ba, which was shown as a bird with a human head. The book contains elements of earlier funerary texts, such as the coffin texts or the Amduat. It was written down on long rolls of papyrus, or its fragments were placed on the tomb's walls. These were illustrations from the Book of the Dead supplemented with short quotations. The book was very popular in the New Kingdom, and an unsystematized version, the so-called Theban recension, was used at that time. Most copies survived in Theban tombs. They were often characterized by random order of texts. The Theban scrolls were inconsistent and chaotic. The Book of the Dead functioned in this form until the late period until the times of the 26th dynasty, when in the 7th century BC, a new, standardized version, the so-called Said recension, was edited. Then the Book of the Dead began to be written down according to a strictly established scheme, chronologically and logically. In this form, it survived until Roman times. In the Book of the Dead, demons appear to be physical beings of flesh and blood. Their names and epithets refer to physical attributes. The Book of the Dead rarely describes individual demons. Usually they are whole groups with collective names and characteristics. The names of demons were rarely written with the determinative of divinity but often using a knife, an animal symbol, or a dead man. The illustrations in the funeral books tried to reflect as many characteristic features of individual groups of demons as possible to make it easier for the deceased to identify them and then utter their names, on which his further fate depended. The deceased could be let in by the guards or defeat them in battle, to move to the next part of the underworld. Despite their chaotic nature, in the Duat they were fully subordinated to the divine will. They watched over the justified souls, which after the judgment of Osiris they helped to get safely to Sekhet Ar, the Egyptian paradise. As we know, the Egyptians believed that when the setting sun disappears behind the horizon, the sun god Ra enters the land of the dead, Duat, on his boat, through the mouth of his mother Nut, the goddess of the heavenly vault. 
He flows into her mystical cosmic body as Osiris Ra and faces dangers there, such as attacks by hostile demons from beyond cosmos, including the most powerful one, the Great Serpent Apophis. After 12 hours, Ra is reborn in the womb of the goddess Nut and comes into the world again in the morning as Hepri, a young son, symbolized by a scarab. The nocturnal journey of a solar bark through the underworld is described in detail in another New Kingdom text. The Book of the Amduat was beautifully illustrated. Its fragments or the full text, as in the tomb of Seti I, can be found almost exclusively in the tombs of the pharaohs, beginning with Tutmos III, KV 34, until the rulers of the 21st dynasty, the first dynasty of the Third Intermediate Period. According to the book, Ra gives strength and rejuvenates the souls of the dead that have entered the Duat. He unties the bandages of the mummified so that they can move freely on the dangerous route of their nocturnal journey. Quote, Your wrappings are undone, your feet may stretch, that you may walk on them, that you may stride far. Armed with the knives and strengthened by Ra, the dead pledge to defend the god in the case of attack by the most powerful of all demons, the primeval serpent Apopis. Apopis, or rather Apep, as the Egyptians called him, was the most powerful and dangerous demon, the Egyptian embodiment of evil. The giant serpent of darkness and chaos attacked light and the cosmic order of Maat. Each night he emerged from the primordial waters of Nun, chaos that surrounded the created universe, and launched an attack on creation. Every night, Ra resisted this destructive force during his nocturnal journey through the Duat. The fight between the Sun God and Apep is a topic for another podcast, but it's worth mentioning that the sunrise in the morning was a sign of another victory of Ra over his greatest enemy. Apopis wasn't a part of the balanced order of Mad, but its external enemy. He has either always existed in the depths of Nun or was born by the ancient mother goddess Neith. There's also another tradition claiming that he was born from the umbilical cord of Ra. Apep symbolized chaos on the offensive, the aggressive aspect of the motionless and impersonal ocean of chaos. With his actions, he alerted not only the gods, but also the entire duat and the beings inhabiting it to defend themselves against destruction. The stakes were high, so anything that disturbed the order and balance of mud, which gave strength to the defenders of creation against Apep, was treated as an unforgivable offense. The sins of people are an insult to the divine law and cosmic truth. Hence, the enemies of Maat became the enemies of Osiris, the lord of the Duat. There was no mercy for them. To eradicate the evil threatening the universe, the gods established the place of annihilation, where the dead condemned by Osiris perished in terrible torment. Both their bodies and all their souls were annihilated, of course, by demons. The existence of hell in the religion of the ancient Egyptians reminds us that although they worshipped harmony and balance, they didn't content themselves with peaceful contemplation of it, but rather they took radical and cruel measures to maintain it. 
A terrible fate awaits sinners in the underworld. We learn details about the God's punishment of evil doers in the Book of Gates, in the description of the Eighth Division of the Duat. Consistently called enemies of Osiris, they are shown in the Book of Gates as bound captives. Horus the Elder leads the wretches, saying, Enemies of my father, let your arms be tied up towards your heads. O oh, who have no power, ye shall be fettered with your arms behind you. Who are hostile to Ra, ye shall be hacked in pieces, ye shall never more have your being. Your souls shall be destroyed, and none of you shall live, because of what you have done to my father Osiris. You have put his mysteries behind your backs and you have dragged out the statue of the god from the secret place. The word of my father Osiris is mad against you, and my word is mad against you. Oh, you shall cease to exist, you shall come to an end. This fragment of the book decorates the famous alabaster sarcophagus of Seti I. This wonderful piece of art also displays a scene with a great serpent breathing fire into the face of a sinner. The serpent is called by Horus Quer. Quote, Open thy mouth, distend thy jaws, and belch forth thy fires against the enemies of my father. Burn them up their bodies, consume their souls by the fire which issue from thy mouth and by the flames which are in thy body. My divine children are against them, they destroy their spirits, and those who have come forth from me are against them, and they shall never more exist. The judgment of the dead is the most important moment in their journey through the Duat. The tried soul stood before the tribunal of the gods led by Osiris. The deceased was to prove his piety by naming each member of the tribunal and enumerating the sins committed before them. At this stage he had to be well prepared, because the life of the religious Egyptians was a service to Maat, truth, cosmic order and balance. If the deceased heart weighed before Osiris didn't balance with the feather of mud, but was heavier instead, a sentence was passed, from which it was impossible to appeal. The divine scribe, Toth, recorded the guilty verdict, and the terrifying hybrid, devourer of the dead, the demonic goddess Amit, who had been waiting near the scales, immediately devoured the condemned man's heart. From then on, it only got worse. The illustrations of the Book of Amduat show sinners as if prisoners of war, chained and led under God to slaughter. In the seventh chapter of the book we read, The majesty of this God said, O oh, your spirits who are hostile to Osiris, who have rebelled against the governor of the Duat, your hands and arms are fettered, and you are tied tightly with bonds, and your souls are kept under ward, and your shades are hacked in pieces. Anku had drawn the cords about you so tightly that you shall never be able to escape from his restraint. The enemies of Osiris kneel before the ruler of the underworld with their hands tied behind their backs. In this position they await decapitation by a cat-headed demon armed with a knife. The demon's name is Violent of the Face. Another of the demons involved in the execution is called the Punisher. The sun god Ra says to Osiris, let your enemies fall beneath your feet. The flames of the living serpent are against them, that he might burn them. Violent of face is against them, that he might cut them down and roast them on a spit for himself. 
In the Book of Gates, Horus commands the beings of the underworld. Smite ye the enemies of my father, and hurl them down into your pits, because of that deadly evil which they have done against the Great One. That which belonged to you to do in the duat is to guard the pits of fire, according as Ra had commanded. The descriptions of Egyptian hell were surprisingly similar to those imagined by Christians, especially in medieval iconography. The well-known motive of sinners tortured by devils in fire pits may have had its origins in the ancient Egyptian texts. The twelfth chapter of the Amduat describes in surprising details these fire pits, their number, names and the demonic stuff carrying out executions on the enemies of Osiris. In the twelfth chapter we read of a large fire pit called Hatet Ketitz with a vaulted roof filled with fire, presided over by a demon with the head of a lioness who holds a large knife in her hands. In the illustrations we see demons at each pit. They pour fire into them from their mouths. Some fire pits are larger, others smaller and have different purposes. For example, a small pit of fire, Hat Nemat Set, is used to absorb the shadows of the damned. A similar pit called Hat Sephos consumes the heads of sinners. The largest pit with vaulted roof filled with fire was used to immerse the damned with their heads down. It's Amt Sekhetu, the valley of those who are turned upside down. Quote, the majesty of this god uttered the decree, saying, Hack in pieces and cut asunder the bodies of the enemies and the members of the dead who have been turned upside down. O my father Osiris, and let me come forth from it. My father, having once been helpless, had smitten you, he had cut up your bodies, he had hacked in pieces your spirits and your souls, and had scattered in pieces your shadows, and had cut in pieces your heads. You shall never more exist, you shall be overthrown, you shall be cast down headlong into the pits of fire, and you shall not escape therefrom, and you shall not be able to flee from the flames which are in. In the illustrations we find at the fire pits hieroglyphs corresponding to their purpose, such as souls, shadows and flesh. The enemies of Osiris as dangerous destroyers of the cosmic order of Mad must be annihilated. This process continues uninterruptedly in the underworld, in the place of annihilation, as the Book of the Earth calls Hell where the damned suffer humiliation, have to eat and drink through the anus and excrete from the mouth, all while waiting to be beheaded and their souls to be burned. Ra has no mercy for the enemies of Osiris. When he appears in the underworld every night, he encourages demons to ruthlessly destroy their souls and orders the gatekeepers to vigilantly look out for and eliminate sinners wandering through the duat. In the place of annihilation was a lake of fire, illustrated with four baboon demons guarding it. Among its destructive flames lived a powerful demon of revenge, am -he called the Devourer of Millions or Eater of Eternity. He was depicted with the head of a hunting dog, resembling a greyhound. In the Lake of Fire, the final annihilation of Osiris' enemies took place. This is how the Lake of Fire is described in the Book of Gates. There is a serpent living in this pool, and the water of the pool is of fire and the gods of the earth and the souls of the earth cannot descend thereto, 
by reason of the flames of fire of this serpent. This great God, who is the governor of the Duat, lived in the water of this pool. The text continues to read. The water of this pool is Osiris, and this water is Kenti Duat. This flame consumed and destroyed the souls which dare to approach Osiris, and the awe of this pool cannot be done away, or made an end of, or overcome. Ultimately, the condemned soul was permanently destroyed in the lake of fire. There's no separate ancient text that describes only hell. Perhaps this is why knowledge about it is not so common today. There are, however, quite numerous references to hell and the demons dwelling there contained in various parts of the sacred books, especially in the Yamduat and the Book of Gates. Finding these fragments and putting them together requires examining these texts in their entirety. The oldest religious texts, the pyramid texts, tell us a little about the fate of the damned and the lack of salvation after death. Of course, because they were intended only for the kings of the old kingdom, living gods, enjoying unlimited power and authority. Therefore, it was inappropriate to question the salvation of the pharaoh. The fall of the Old Kingdom is the democratization of funeral texts. In the Middle Kingdom, every Egyptian could obtain spells guaranteeing salvation after death, for a fee, of course. The coffin texts enabled wealthy Egyptians to follow in the footsteps of their divine rulers. They were largely based on the pyramid texts. Interestingly, they describe the deceased with the prefix Osiris, which means that everyone after death could be identified with God. Because how else could one achieve immortality? It was not until the New Kingdom, when rich sources, the sacred books such as Amduat, the Book of the Underworld, revealed the pitiful fate of the damned Egyptians. Not only was every step of the deceased in the underworld traced, but he was prepared with the help of numerous spells and instructions to avoid damnation, the second death and annihilation, the destruction of all his souls. The stakes were high. Maintaining the balance of mud means the continuation of the work of creation, resisting chaos also on earth, it's also the security of Egypt, peace and prosperity of its inhabitants. Of course, every owner of the Book of the Dead expected that at the court of Osiris he would be found not guilty of sins against Mat, justified, as the ancients said, or ma -khero. Such a person could finally enjoy eternal life. The Book of Gates is another sacred text of the New Kingdom, describing the night journey of the deceased through the Duat. The richly illustrated text of the book can be found in Ramasi tombs, mainly royal ones. You could say it's a more practical version of Amduat. It contains elements unknown in other books, such as mysterious goddesses with stars above their heads, symbolizing the hours of night, or a unique presentation of the posthumous procession of various human races. Next to the Egyptians, we see Asians, Nubians and Libyans, which suggests that foreigners can also count on salvation, even though the traditional Egyptian view saw other nations as enemies of mud and servants of chaos. First of all, however, the book gives us invaluable information about demons and their role in the underworld. 
In the Book of Gates we read, The company of the gods of Ra, who repulse Apep, say, Thy head is slit, O Apep, thy folds are gashed. Thou shalt never more envelop the boat of Ra, and thou shalt never again make a way into the divine park. A flame of fire goes out against thee from the hidden place, and we have condemned thee to thy dire doom. When the sun sets in the sky and dusk turns into darkness, the first hour of night begins. This is the boundary between the world of the living and the dead. The fleeting first portal through which the deceased passes is Arit, a non-physical gate that opens for a short moment. The second identical Arit portal is located at the exit from Duat in the twelfth hour of the night. The second type of gates are Seba, real physical gates in the Duat that can be passed through during the remaining ten hours of the night. The secret entrance to the first gate was supposed to be somewhere in the necropolis of Abydos, in a deep mountain crevice. Hence the first pharaohs such as Scorpion, Nama and Jer built their tombs there. Of course, in the New Kingdom, when the rulers began to carve their tombs in western Thebes, in the Valley of the Kings, the actual entrance portal to the Duat was claimed to be hidden somewhere in the pyramid-shaped mountain of Alkarna, called Ta Debent by the ancients. The local Theban goddess of the necropolis, Meretzegar, according to the Egyptians, lived on the top of the mountain. The cobra goddess was supposed to guard their secret gate to the underworld. The second gate of Duat, Seba, leads to another dimension, dominated by water, in whose surface the deceased sees his or her reflection as if in a large mirror. This is a place of discovering the truth about oneself and insight into the subconscious, a fight against internal demons that is supposed to cleanse the soul like the water through which the deceased steps during the second hour of the night. Demonic gate guardians are best described in the chapters 144 to 147 in the Book of the Dead. Said version contains 190 chapters. This part describes the journey of the deceased Ka through the gates to the afterlife, the last obstacle standing on the way to the Egyptian paradise. Before the deceased finally attains salvation and eternal life, he must pass through the seven great halls. Each hall is guarded by one or two creatures, whose names as well as the names of the gates had to be repeated by the deceased before he could pass. The three guards of the first gate are a ram-headed man, a seated man with a gazelle in his hands, and a baboon-headed man holding a staff topped with an ear of grain. The hieroglyphic text describes their names as follows. The name of its doorkeeper is one with inverted faces, numerous of forms, of the one who guards it, hearer, and of the one who reports in it, roaring of voice. The second gate is guarded by demons in the form of a seated man with a ram's head, a hippopotamus standing on its hind legs with a dagger in his hands, and another peacock-headed man with a staff topped with an ear of grain. The text reads, The second gate, the name of its doorkeeper is He with extended forehead, of the one who guards it, watchful of face, and of the one who reports in it, burning one. 
The names of the guardians of the third gate are Eater of putrefaction, of the one who guards it, he with alert heart, and of the one who reports in it, great one. Among them is a bizarre crouching figure with a knife, which instead of a head has a turtle. The names of the guards of the next four gates are Punisher of Attackers Repulsive of face, many-voiced, alert of face, he who lives on worms, burning one, a destructive of face, raging of onslaught, attacker of bread, violent of voice, he who crushes them, loud-voiced. All these terrifying names the deceased had to know and recite to overcome this last obstacle on the way to paradise, Sekhet Aru. As we read in the tomb of Menek Hibnekau, O, oh, you seven gates, and you who watch over Osiris, who guard your gates, O, oh, you who report the affairs of the lands to Osiris daily, this Osiris Menek Hibnekau knows you and knows your names. Ra Osiris maintains in the Duat an entire army of beings ready to repel Apopis' attack at any moment. According to the Book of Gates, it includes a group of twelve Kerumetau deities who guard the seventh gate of the Duat. Quote, our weapons in our hands are for Ra and against Mamo and we will make gashes in the great and evil worm. O oh, Ra, do away the heads when they come forth from the windings of the serpent Kweti. These are the gods who are in the boat of Ra, and they repulse Apep in the sky, and they travel through the Duat. It is their duty to turn back Apep on behalf of Ra in Amentet and the places of the Duat and this god allotted to them, their provisions of bread and their beer, and their libations are of cool water, and offerings are made to them upon earth, because they repulse the enemy of Ra in Amentet. It was the images of these twelve gods that I saw on the walls of several royal tombs in the Valley of the Kings. They walk proudly, holding the huge body of a tamed serpent. They are enigmatically described as those who have food when their heads appear from his folds. An interesting description of a serpent from whose body human heads emerge relates to Seba, probably an aspect of Apopis himself. Ra commands the gods of Kerumetau. Quote, Turn your back, Seba, make you to go backwards Apep when the heads appear from out of him, and let him perish. Ra ordered for him his destruction. O oh, heads, you shall be eaten, you shall be eaten, you shall be consumed when you come forth from him. Ra ordered for them when they come forth that they shall be consumed in their folds when he journeyed to them, and that the heads shall retreat within their folds. The warm Hefau shall be without eyes, and he shall be without his nose, and he shall be without his ears, and he shall exist upon his roarings, and he shall live upon that which he himself uttered. Why do the heads appear on a serpent, and why are they eaten by the gods? The Egyptians didn't know the word demon. Their books inform us that the underworld was inhabited by supernatural creatures that are not gods. There are so many of them there. We know how ambiguous and multidimensional was the idea of the ancient Egyptians about their gods, their numerous personifications. The same case was with those less or hardly known minor deities 
of various appearance and unclear functions. If it were not for the context in which their descriptions and attributes, such as knives, appear, it would be extremely difficult to distinguish demons from deities. Since the time of the pyramid texts, they have been depicted in anthropomorphic and hybrid forms, with animal heads. The most popular animal forms in Egyptian demonology are snakes, lionesses, baboons and rams, like the mysterious dangerous creature known from the pyramid texts, the black ram, called the Lord of Power. Symbolized by the black sun or the shadow of the sun, it was an evil force trying to destroy the sun. His aggressive destructive nature is used by Osiris to destroy his enemies in the realm of the dead. Evil and dangerous by nature, demons therefore serve to do the greater good. Egyptian demons used to be mediators between gods and people. Of course, they were used by the gods to contact people. They were worshipped, although they didn't have designated shrines. This changed in the Greco-Roman period when temple cults of some of them, the so-called demon lords, appeared. The most popular Egyptian demons include Menech, the butcher or the slayer. Already known in the coffin texts, a powerful demon depicted as a human mummy, sometimes with a lion's head. Also called chief of the demons. He had an amazing career in Ptolemic Egypt, as he was worshipped as a minor deity controlling other demons. His cult was centered around the great Ptolemic sanctuaries in Edfu, Dendera and Esna. Interestingly, Menech probably even had his own priests. Though cruel and amoral, Egyptian demons can hardly be described as exclusively evil. Sometimes called the messengers of Osiris, they are associated with the judgment of the dead, and their function is to punish the evildoers, the enemies of Osiris. In the Book of the Dead we read, If this book is used on earth, he, the deceased, shall not be seized by the messenger who attacks those who commit wrong in the whole earth. As guardians of the next gates of the Duat, they actually protected the sacred places. Some of them served not only in the underworld, but also on earth, mentioned in magical texts evil spirits inhabiting the world of the living until recently were considered by Egyptologists to be a completely separate category. It turns out, however, that the line between these two realities is fluid. Gangs of wanderer demons were rarely featured. However, we know their collective names thanks to magical texts and descriptions of amulets that protected ancient Egyptians in contact with them. These demons aroused fear among the Egyptians, who resorted to magical practices to avoid contact. To prevent them from entering their homes, they painted false doors on the walls of their houses with red paint. However, if a demon sneaked into the house, it could not only cause nightmares for the unfortunate person, but also demonic possession, and even kill him. The most feared group was a group of wanderer demons, called the Slaughterers. They were emissaries of the goddess Sekhmet, who cruelly punished humanity and were said to bring diseases and plagues. These types of demons were often not created by the gods, but were transformed souls of the dead, who were not justified in the judgment of Osiris, but for some reason escaped total destruction. 
they returned to Earth, causing problems for the living. Their list of spells against such evil spirits is preserved among many sources written by the inhabitants of the famous Theban village of worker artists in Der El Medina, known in antiquity as Sed Mad. Local priests helped to get rid of a migraine in one of their residents who was tormented by the demon Sak. Their spells describe him as a naked child, suffering from a headache. Demons of this type lived on earth in desolate places, in the desert, in caves, pits, abandoned tombs, or in streams among the reeds. Some moved mostly at night to spread terror in nearby settlements. Undoing the misfortunes committed by demons on individuals, families or entire communities was part of the daily service of Egyptian priests. I hope you learned something new about the beliefs of ancient Egyptians. Thank you for listening. Please let me know in the comments what you would like to hear about next time. I'd like to give a special thank you to Grzegorz, my first patron ever with the highest membership Ancient History Maniac. Thank you for your trust. I would also like to thank all my patrons and all those who supported me by sending super thanks. I truly appreciate your contribution. If you don't support me yet, but would like to, I placed my Patreon link below in the description. Don't forget to like my video and subscribe to my channel. Goodbye and see you on the next one.